there was one chapter in the whole of the Bible that speaks best to the ministry philosophy that we have at this church, it would be these verses in Ephesians chapter 4. And so we're going to try the next few minutes together to think from first principles about what we're trying to do in this church. And, um, uh, and when you do that, this is the passage to go to, the big picture, the vision for our church. You see it here? It is to glorify God by seeing Annandale and Surrounds grow as disciples of Jesus. But these verses of Ephesians 4, they kind of underlie that. As we think about our goals, our direction as a church, it's about how do we become more mature in Christ? How do we grow as disciples? And then how do we play our part to serve Christ in ministry to encourage other people to grow as disciples? So I just want to say right up front, I'm really glad you're here. If if you're new with us at Village Church, this is a great night for working out what makes this place tick. Um, Tonight, it's going to be a really helpful day and and, because in the letter to the Ephesians... The first three chapters are about what do we believe. In chapter 4, sentence 1, you see the word chapter 4, sentence 1, first word? Therefore. Having three chapters of what do we believe, therefore, what do we do? Now, there are some people who I know first time ever at church, and so I can't just go to what do we do till I talk about what do we believe. So I'm just going to jump back to chapter 2 for a minute and do what do we believe for a minute or two to orientate ourselves. And I mean, if you're following along on the outline, you'll see that uh, I'm still under point one. I'm doing the background. Um, now, let me think. Chapter two, verse one, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked. You were dead in trespasses and sins. I'm, I'm, I remember actually I'm married to a doctor. I remember her coming home from work one day. She'd been working at the hospital. And I said, how was work? And she said, well, as soon as I walked in the door, I had to write death certificates for four people who had died overnight. And she looked at them. She made, her, in her professional opinion, she came to the view that they were dead. And so she wrote a death certificate. Now, when she was talking to me that day, she was talking about being physically dead. Chapter 2, verse 1 is talking about being spiritually dead. How do you make a diagnosis that someone is spiritually dead? Well, the symptoms. Chapter 2, 1, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked. How did you previously walk? Symptom 1, you previously walked according to the ways of the world. You were walking, symptom 1, According to the way of Netflix, according to the way of Stan, you were walking the way of spiritual death. Second, second symptom, you walked according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now at work in the discipline. You walked the devil's way. The devil said, go this way, and, and you went that way. Now, I don't just think that means getting involved in Halloween. It's broader than that. It does mean that, but it's broader than that. But symptom three is you walk the way of your own evil desires, your own evil choices. So verse 3, we too previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. We were by nature children under wrath. You you used to walk the, the way of spiritual death. You were spiritually dead. You were following the ways of the world, following the devil, and following your own evil choices. And now, if you're spiritually dead, you can't do anything about it. The only way you can be moved from the spiritually dead state to spiritual life is if somebody external does something. And the someone external who does something is God. Look at chapter 2, verse 4. God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive. He made us alive. He moved us from spiritual death to life. With Christ, even though we were spiritually dead in trespasses, you are saved, rescued from death to life by grace. We were dead and then this external agent, God, made us alive. It was totally from God and nothing from me. 
And now that I've been moved from being dead to alive, from spiritual death to spiritual life, there's a new task, a new life for me to live. You see it in verse 10. We are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we would walk in them. We were walking in trespasses and sins, and now we are to walk in this new way, a new walking to do, verse 10. It's not that God saves us and leaves us be. He has a new walk for us to walk in. Now, you keep going through Ephesians and these first three chapters of Ephesians, all about what God has done for us, rescuing us, making us alive, uniting us. And then chapter 4, verse 1, this therefore, the shift in logic. And we move from theology to practicality, from um, doctrine to duty, from exposition to exportation, from indicative to imperative. And so point two on the outline, what will the worthy walk look like? This walk worthy of the calling that I've received. Well, it starts with the heart. And and there's going to be attitudes of the heart that we're going to want to pursue. So you see there in verse 2, he says, walk worthy of the calling you've received with all, verse 2, humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Now, you read those words, patience and gentleness and bearing with one another in love. They're the fruit of the Spirit. The love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. If I've got God's spirit walking, working in me, then I should expect those kind of characteristics to be developing in me. And God is working by his spirit to make me like that. And I'm told here to, I'm urged here actually, to walk worthy of this, to, to pursue this. Now, these aren't the attributes that our society pursues. I mean, the society doesn't hold up as valuable humility and gentleness and patience. And I think the reason we struggle to exhibit those characteristics in our lives is Western society, Sydney, does not value them. But that is the picture of Christian maturity. That's the character we're to aspire to. Second thing we're to aspire to is verse 3, making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Now, we've been talking here at Village Church the last couple of weeks about, uh, we we talked about it in chapter two of Ephesians and chapter three of Ephesians. We talked about what God has done by his spirit to bring these two different people groups together. And, And in the first place, it was the two different people groups of Jews and Gentiles, but brought together into one new person by God. But I drew the contemporary application in the Christian church that people get brought together who who normally would not be allies and and normally might even be critical or uh, uh, antagonistic to each other. Verse three, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace, make every effort not to be divisive. The unity of the spirit, the bond of peace, um, that's not achieved by saying there's peace when there isn't. That's not achieved by plastering over cracked walls. That's not achieved by pretending things are okay when they're not. We need to work to pursue the unity of the spirit. And the devil's key strategy for undermining Christian ministry is through promoting division in the church. And it generally doesn't come through front-on attack. It generally comes through, um, through the side door, through, um, through whinging, through criticising, through triangling, through knocking, through speaking behind back. Now, I I just want to encourage you on this, that no comment is neutral. Every sentence you say can have the effect of promoting the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace or undermining the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. I mean, it could be tonight. Um, One of the team who's helping to organise the Thanksgiving dinner 
They might go around at dinner time saying, do you want to sign up and come along to the Thanksgiving dinner? $10 to come to the Thanksgiving dinner on the 13th of... Um, and um, they, they come, they interrupt your little... You're in a group with four or five, they interrupt your conversation and you smile and say, ah, here they are selling the Thanksgiving dinner and make the smart comment that kind of give, lifts you socially but actually makes it harder to encourage people to come to the Thanksgiving dinner. Do you, do you, do you see how the, the smart aleck comment can actually work against the building of the body? Because it's going to be encouraging to go to the... It's a good thing to go to the Thanksgiving dinner. Now, this unity, it's not just about the heart of humility, gentleness and patience. It's not just about the actions. The unity is also about belief. Um, in order to be united, there needs to be a common set of understanding, a, a, a trusting in the same beliefs. Now, you see that in verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father, who is above all and through all and in all. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6, is one of the earliest Christian creeds. It's a statement of faith. There is one Holy Spirit who brings about that initial unity. There is one Lord Jesus who dies for our wrong before the Almighty and is raised again. And there is one God and Father of all. And then there are associated faith positions, one hope of heaven, one faith, one body of teaching, for which is once for all delivered for the saints. There is one baptism, Father, Son and Spirit, one body, the church. That there's a summary of belief. And, and Christians over the years have developed summaries of beliefs around which we can unite. They've called them creeds. There's the Apostle Creed, the, the Nicene Creed, the, the Creed of St. Athanasius. And, but, but this verse, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, this is, I think it's the first ever Christian creed. And we unite around the statement of faith. Now, this group, this people group, this in the church in Ephesus that Paul is writing to, they share these things. They're united in one spirit, one Lord, one God. They're united in one faith, one hope, one baptism. But the members are diverse. The members are all different. And, and, and how does it work to have the same faith and yet be diverse people? So the way it works is Jesus ascended, risen from the dead, gives gifts to his church. You see it there, I'm at point 3a on the outline, if you're following on the outline. Um, verse 7, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took the captives captive. He gave gifts to people. But what does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth. The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all things. The Lord Jesus Christ has, verse 9, descended to the lower... He, he, he came down. He, he, he was seated at the right hand of the Father, born in a stable at Christmas time, lived among us, was executed, treated as a lowly criminal, died, and then ascended, rose again, ascended to the heavens seated at the right hand of the Father. And the ascended Jesus gives gifts, variety of gifts, to his church. And, and, and look at the gifts mentioned. Verse 11, Jesus gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. Now these gifts, what do they have in common? Well, they're given by Christ but they are word gifts. 
the apostles, the sent ones, the initial communicators of the news of the resurrection of Christ, the prophets, they're the ones who bring the word of God and apply it to our lives, the evangelists, they're the people who first introduce you to the saviour, the pastors, the shepherds, they protect, they, uh, they, they shepherd the flock of God and the teachers, they explain, correct, rebuke and train the way of God to you. What do the gifts have in common? They're all to do with the word. Now, who are they today? Well, I'm one. I'm a teacher, pastor. Who are they today? Well, the community group leaders, they're teachers, pastors. The Introducing God leaders, they're the evangelists. They're all of these people, they're word gift people. Um, but it's actually broader than that. What do they do? Now, what's their role? Now, I'm going to introduce you to a theological debate. And um, across Protestantism, our understanding of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, changed in 1971. Um, the main English translation of the Bible from around the 16th century was the King James Version. For 400 years, it was just every... I mean, we, there's so many translations of the Bible today in English, it's amazing, but for 400 years, there was just one translation. In 1946, the New Testament of the Revised Standard Version was published. And in 1971, the second edition of the Revised Standard Version was published. And... I'm going to introduce you to the Great Comma Controversy of 1971. Who's heard of the Great Comma Controversy of 1971? Ah, blessings on you. Um, <laughs> now, this is great. You'll be able to say, I was at Village Church the night they told us about the Great Comma Controversy of 19... Actually, if you're just new to Christian things, this is a moment to have a little sleep. Um, uh, just, you, just, there's a... If, if there's a moment you just want to tune out and have a little sleep in this talk, now's the moment. If, um, if you've been thinking Christian things, I mean, if you're a Bible nerd, and let's face it, a Bible nerd is the best kind of nerd to be. Um, if you're a Bible nerd, this is the time to get really excited. Okay, grab your Bible, look at it, verse 12, and have you got a comma after the word saints? Hand up who's got a comma after the word saints. Anyone? Interesting. No one here with the King James Version. You know, no one here with the first edition Revised Standard Version. Well, if this sermon had been given in 1970, everyone's hand would have gone up. Because the great comma controversy was deleting the comma after the word saints. Now, how does the meaning change if you delete the comma? after the word saints. Who wants to have a go? Ah, uh, Emerson, you've thought about this before. Um, that's cheating. Um, but all right, okay, we'll give you a microphone. Come on, let's uh, take, your, take your mask off and tell us. So how does the, how does the meaning change? Oh, now I'm nervous. Um, with the comma, there's a difference between equipping the saints and the work of ministry. Ah, with the comma, there's a difference between equipping the saints and the work of ministry. Let's put it up on the screen and we'll... we'll, we'll go. On the left, he himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now, the left is pre-1971. Two, bullet point one, equip the saints. Bullet point two for the work of ministry, bullet point three, to build up the body of Christ. And they're kind of all seen as kind of synonyms. You know, that, that's what you meant, isn't it? Well, yeah, pre-1971, there's, you're equipping the saints, then there's also the work of ministry. Whereas yeah. removing the comma, you're equipping the saints to do the work of ministry. Yes, so you can see, if you like the green one on the right, post-1971, you... The, the five word gifts. Um, we can turn the lights back on now. The, the five word gifts, the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the teachers, they are given to equip the saints. 
to, and then the saints do the work of ministry. All the people of God, all of us do the work of ministry and together they build the body of Christ. So you see the difference, the pre-1971 interpretation, you actually had a priestly class. It was the particular group of those five people. They did all the ministry. Whereas now we see that, I mean, let me take it through slowly. Um, I'm, I'm at point C, going to go through. First thing, the word people, the pastor, teacher, evangelist, prophet, their job is to, chapter 12, verse, to Ephesians 4, verse 12, equip the saints for works of ministry. Um, <laughs> I was told this story, I think I've told it before here, but um, about 15 years ago, my friend Archie Poulos asked me if I would present at a conference, at an elective on a conference. And it was one of those... Um, I had this happen a few times with Archie because he's so clever. He'd ring up and say, Dominic, can you present at an elective at this conference? And I'd say, oh, yeah, what do you want, to, what do you want me to say? And he said, well, I'd like you to do a, a, an elective on turning your church into a ministry training centre. I said, oh, what does that mean? He said, well, you're not doing church as the first thing. You're training people in ministry as the first thing. So that the DNA of the place is all about how can you train in ministry? And I don't know if anybody who came to the elective found it helpful, but it revolutionised my thinking. Um, and as I've thought back about it, it's actually come out of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, that my job as a pastor is to equip you for works of ministry so that together we can build the body of Christ. Now, so um, that means the ministry at Village is not done by a few. Everyone is involved. Everyone is called on to be shoulder to the wheel. Everyone is called on to be exercising their gifts. Everyone is being developed and trained and is stretching and growing in their ability to do the work of ministry. And so wherever we can, we want to be encouraging people to take the initiative, to give it a go, to making it a safe space where somebody who doesn't know what they're doing can actually have a go and try it out. It's safe to fail. But the goal in equipping the saints is to see those gifts exercised so that the body of Christ will be built. Now, when we talk about our vision statement of growing disciples, you could say building the body of Christ. But it's a vision of growing disciples and building Christ's body wider, more people, deeper, going deeper in the word. And the goal in the end is that we, 13, all reach unity in the faith. We all reach agreement in the faith. Now, faith there, it's, it's, it's not meaning trust. Um, like we so often use the word faith, the faith means the body of teaching, that we, meet, we, we, we move to unity agreement in the body of teaching, the one spirit, one hope, one Lord. Now, a few years ago, um, I was speaking, at a, I was a guest speaker at a big church conference and um, uh, lots and lots and lots of young adults there and I gave a talk and presented on this verse and we went to question time and it just blew up in a spectacular question time. I mean, it was, um, it was probably one of my more tra traumatic question times because um, I completely failed to persuade them to the view that I I I'd say this and that somebody would argue there and somebody else would argue and I, I, I failed to persuade them in the direction I wanted to persuade them, which was the direction that I thought the passage was going in. Now, I was arguing we as a community group, we as a Bible study group, ought to be pursuing unity in the faith. I was saying we as a church, village church, you ought to be pursuing unity in the faith, agreement. I was saying we as a denomination ought to be pursuing unity in the faith, agreement. I was saying we as all the denominations ought to be pursuing unity in the faith, agreement. And the pushback that I got that night in the question time 
was person after person, that's ridiculous. That's absurd. That's impossible. How in this postmodern world could we ever possibly even begin to aspire to come to agreement? Now, in the defence of the people in that question time, and you might be thinking, I feel like you're on their side. I mean, you don't have to look long at the church nationally or the church internationally to feel like that sounds like a difficult idea. But this is the goal that we are given by the, the apostle of God, working by the spirit of God, to aspire to that direction, that we're to grow into maturity with a stature, I'm um, actually... We're to reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. We're to grow into maturity. We're to, to grow up into maturity. We start as a baby, then we're an infant, then we're a primary school, then we're a high school, then we're a tertiary educator, and we're pursuing maturity. Now, we as a collective body of Christ... And as individuals, we're, striking to, we're striving to be more mature, to be more like the person of Jesus Christ. And as we grow, verse 14, then we will no longer be little children. I have to say, to be a little child is normal for a while. But you should not stay as infants. And in fact, one who stays immature and says, it's totally fine, I don't need to be pursuing spiritual growth, um, in the end, it's actually irresponsible and you're culpable if you are happy just to stay as an immature Christian. Because you should be aiming to grow out of infancy. Now, I'm beginning to roll into the argument. You know, does this happen to you? You have this moment where you lose an argument and then you're at home later on washing the dishes and you replay the argument in your head. Think of all the things that you wish you'd said. Is it, it's not just me who has that, is it? No, good, okay. Well, I, w I spent months trying to work out how I should have handled that question time better. Here are some of the things I should have said. One who stays as an infant is actually culpable. You've got to grow to maturity. You've got to work at growing into maturity. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Peter speaks of the Christians there as newborn babes, but says, don't stay there, grow to be mature. In 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 and 2, in Hebrews 5, verse 13, he speaks of people who were infants who should grow. Now, why is it bad to be an infant? Why do you need to grow? Well, an infant is defensive, is defenseless. Um, they're unable to protect themselves. They're not able to protect themselves from false teachers. They're, they're like um, ships at sea without adequate ballast, being blown around by the wild winds, and they get tossed around. That's what it says. Next verse, verse 14. They're, know that then you'll no longer be little children tossed by the waves, blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning and cleverness in the techniques of the devil. When I first became a Christian, I, um, I started to read Christian books and, um, and I found lots of these, I found lots of Christian books, I found them really encouraging and can I just say, if you've just become a Christian, start reading Christian books. Really good to read biographies of Christians of the past, of things that they're doing of, and learn the Christian life by, by seeing some great, uh, one of the Christian books, they're pointing this way, this way, actually I hadn't realised it before at the time because I... I wasn't discerning enough, but one was pulling me off in this direction and one was pulling me off in this direction and I was being tossed. I didn't even know. I didn't know. I wasn't discerning enough. I didn't... I was tossed around. This one was one I read, Crossing the Switchblade by David Wilkerson. He was a pastor in New York City in Times Square in New York. He was a pastor amongst the drug gangs and the, and the, the wild people of Times Square. And I just thought it was amazing reading of the powerful work of the Spirit in all these different people's lives. And I read it, felt encouraged. Years later, I went back and read this book again and thought, wow, it is bizarre. It's so different to mainstream Christianity. But I, I, I couldn't tell at the time because um, I didn't have the discernment. And so when you're a young Christian 
You're going to hear arguments put, you're going to get pushed back and forward, and, and actually to a level this discussion and debate is good because it's only by discussing and debating that you can actually, you say, you say in community, what about this? Somebody says, what about that? And you analyse it, you look at the passages, I don't think that makes sense because of, and you're, you're wrestling and then hopefully by the end of the night you come to an agreement, a unity in the faith that our community group is settled, this is what it means. But those debates, they can be tossed around if you're an infant. And actually, to be frank, some of the people you read out there who do the debating, they are crafty, human, cunning, cleverness, techniques of deceit. But Christian maturity, growing into the unity and the faith, that enables you, strengthens you, to distinguish from evil, from right and wrong. Now, final comment. What are we to do? Verse 15. Speaking the truth in love. What we're to be about is speaking the truth in love. To, to speak the truth in love is about living truthful lives lovingly. I find this really, really helpful. I've got to be truthing in love. I need truth and I need love. Truth without love is sandpaper. But love without truth is syrup. Now, I look at different Christian friends and sometimes I look at one of them over here and I think, you're actually behaving like a truth without love person, a sandpaper person. And I look at another friend and I think, you're behaving like a, a love without truth person, a syrup person. Now, I find as a pastor, the pressure is always on me to be a syrup person. I've got to speak the truth in love. And when I communicate the truth in love, then it says, speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head Christ. Now, conclusion. Then we'll take um, questions. If you want to submit a question at villagechurch.sydney slash live or on the website that you checked in on when you arrived. Conclusion. The Apostle Paul is calling on us, urging us to walk in a way worthy of the Lord. Aim is unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to be in agreement, to be built to maturity. What are we to do to achieve that aim? Well, God gives us, Christ gives us the word gifts people. They prepare us for works of service. They equip us for works of service so that together we might all work to build the body of Christ to unity. So application, get prepared. Get prepared. I I think of myself as a um, pastor teacher. I see that's job's, God, job, God's job description for me. I think of the community group leaders as pastor teachers. And so I take it's my job, the other community group leaders, to prepare the members for works of service. And so what I'm doing here on a Sunday night by teaching the Bible is I'm preparing the sound desk person for a work of service. What I'm doing here on a Sunday night is I'm preparing the, the people who are the community team who've made the dinner for us tonight for works of service, or I'm preparing the team who'll be the connection team next Sunday night for works of service, or I'm preparing the band for works of service. You say, but Dominic, you don't know how to teach a band how to play. You don't know how to teach a community team how to cook. You don't know how to teach a sound disc guy, desk guy how to do that. I don't. But I'm preparing them by teaching them the word of God so that they see how their work of service actually fits in God's big plan of building the community to maturity, of building us to be united in faith. So when you exercise your gift on the sound desk or your gift on the live stream or your gift on the piano or your gift on welcoming, you're all contributing to the unity and the faith in maturity in the Son of God. Now, so what is the application for you? Use your preparers. Listen well. Now, some of you, good on you. 
here's a little thing. I want to encourage you to take notes at church. Um, it's never easy to say this because people look around and think, I'm not taking any notes. Them. I think it's great to take notes at church. Why do I think it's great to take notes? Because when I'm in my professional life, if there's anything I want to remember, I write it down. Now, if you come to my office at home, in my filing cabinet, I have sermon notes after sermon notes after sermon notes. Um, when I was working on my preparation for today, I went and looked as part of my preparation and I found the notes I'd taken on Sunday night church on Ephesians chapter 4, listening to a sermon in 1991 and the notes I'd taken on a Sunday night sermon in 1987. And I looked at the notes of those sermons and I thought, oh, I'd taken detailed notes and some of those clever lines, I mean that that line that I used at the beginning to communicate the issues of from theology to practicality, from doctrine to duty, from exposition to exhortation, from indicative to imperative, you thought I was really clever. I ripped it off from 1991. There you go. But you could use that line to explain the logic shift between chapters 1 to 3 and chapters 4 to 6 when you're leading a Bible study on Ephesians chapter 4 in three years' time. And just like I didn't give the guy in 1990... I mean, you actually tell them, I got this line from a great and godly man via Dominic Steele. Use your preparers and then get to work. Exercise the gifts. Uh, in the vision booklet, there are so many people exercising their gifts and we want to be striving to exercise our gifts, to develop our gifts, to extend our gifts, to be more effective in building the body of Christ. Now, if we do that, if we're all exercising our gifts and we're all exercising our gifts to build the body of Christ to unity, you know what's going to happen? Those people who step forward for full-time ministry, they're just going to bubble out the top because the whole culture is about people developing their gifts to build the body of Christ for unity. But that unity, not wallpaper unity, not pretending unity, but agreement unity where the issues are talked through. Let me lead us in prayer. Our Father God, we, we want to thank you, Lord God, that we were dead and you made us alive. You gave us this walk. Help us to walk worthy of you. Help us to pursue unity in our hearts. Help us to pursue unity in our actions. But mostly, Lord, help us to pursue unity in our beliefs. Thank you, Lord God, that the risen Christ gives gifts. The pastor, the teacher, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist to equip us for works of service. Lord, we pray that we would be getting equipped, paying attention to those word gifts people and then implementing those gifts in our daily life as we work together to build the body of Christ to unity. And we pray that you'd help us to do this truthing in love. In the powerful name of Jesus, amen. Amen.